Thank you all for being here. I'm honored to have the opportunity to help kick off this year's summit and to address uh, you guys today. And what's happening here at the New York City Media Lab is tremendously important. The more closely we can work together with our cities, universities, and tech companies, the more successful and creative and vibrant our entire community will be. I'm excited to see your demos, and I think this is a, a great organization. So the spirit of the summit, the spirit of using technology to build new things is something that I love, and that's been a part of who I am for as long as I could remember, long before I started Shutterstock. I was a kid who tore apart his parents' VCR and put it back together, and sometimes it didn't wind up working when I put it back together, but that's kind of the cost of the, uh, the learning process. I would camp out in the back of my local radio shack, uh, putting together whatever random stuff I would find in the uh, little packages, the resistors and transistors, um, basically until they threw me out uh, at night. And I couldn't be pried away from my Apple II, because back then I wrote code for hours, simply for the thrill of watching a computer produce something that would take a human uh, months to do by hand. So when I was in college, I started looking for any way that I could apply this passion, my passion in technology, out in the real world by building things for people to use. I tried everything. I built a pop-up locker, uh, an advertising network, uh, even a dating website. And many of these were useful to a small group of people, but none of them really survived. But on my 10th attempt, I found something that worked, and, and that was Shutterstock. And I believe that we're still just getting started, but I have to admit that with nearly 500 employees, a million customers, and hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, Shutterstock has turned out to be far more successful than I had originally imagined. And you may wonder, why is that? Sometimes I do. Um, and why did Shutterstock work why, when the others didn't? And you may wonder more generally, what sets the best opportunities apart from the rest as you guys build also? And as I reflected on Shutterstock's success so far and the success of the largest tech companies in the world, I believe there's one underlying theme that's constant across all of them. And I'd like to share that with you today. I believe that the very best business opportunities exist when technology makes, some, makes new things possible for the very first time. When technology shows up that lets you second guess the rules that used to apply, that's when you know you've, you've hit on something. And this idea may seem simple, but it's actually pretty deeply important. And to explain what I mean, I'll share three examples of how Shutterstock's, Shutterstock's success is due to specific shifts in technology that made brand new things possible. I hope these examples help you identify what new opportunities may exist for you and your companies today. For the first example, remember back to what it used to be like to create images and share them with the world. It used to be very expensive and difficult, and you need to spend tens of thousands of dollars on camera equipment and take classes just to be able to create a good photo. And if you wanted to publish something to a broad audience, that was expensive and difficult too, and it limited content distribution to the few organizations that it could afford to run uh, print or broadcast TV. And when it came to communication, everything was set up to meet the needs of small elite group of people that can afford to create and publish in, on this medium. And then technology changed the rules. Cameras became cheaper and easier to use. Design software and digital distribution arrived and made it possible for anyone to bring their ideas to life and communicate uh, them to others. And suddenly the world changed from a place where very few could do something to where anyone could. And that was Shutterstock's moment. We saw what technology made possible for the first time and tried that out. Instead of working with a small number of professional photographers to distribute their work to a handful of big companies, we opened up Shutterstock's marketplace to anyone. And instead of charging big company prices, we made high quality images affordable for anyone right over the web. And it worked. Now we have the largest library of its kind. We have over 40 million images in our library, and we license more than four images every second. So four times per second, one of the photographers in our network, one of the 60,000 photographers, gets paid. And without the democratization of photography and publishing, Shutterstock could not have existed. And so here's another example of how technology made new things possible and created opportunity for us. It used to be that storing and moving big media files around was slow and expensive. And sharing a video with a large audience was restricted to the small group of people who produced for TV and film. And then technology changed the rules. Telcos spent billions of dollars to wire the planet with broadband. And it became clear that even phones would one day be able to stream HD video. 
Cheap storage and computing power made it easier than ever to store and manipulate video. For the first time, one company could reasonably centralize, store, and distribute the world's best video. And that was our second moment. Eight years ago, only a year after YouTube was founded, we launched Shutterstock Video to help video creators find and license the clips they needed to create their finished product. And that worked also. And now our video business is doubling year over year on tens of millions of dollars in revenue. And we think that the rise of digital video is still in its early phases and that video will be a key player of our business, key pillar of our business. And here's a third example of how technology opened up a new opportunity that made Shutterstock possible. It used to be that finding customers for anything but a mass market product was very difficult. Advertising was one large megaphone that spoke to everyone, which was inefficient and expensive, especially when you considered that your customers could be anywhere in the world. And then technology changed the rules again. It became possible to reach people based on their own interests and behavior so that you can find your audience and speak just to them, no matter where they were in the world and no matter what language they spoke and no matter what they were looking for. And suddenly it became possible to serve a truly global audience. This realization was so important to me that I insisted on doing something pretty silly to make the point early on. The first language we launched after English was Japanese. I picked the hardest language to figure out and started there so that we all understood the importance of our newly available global community. Turns out Japan started to grow for us as a business right at that moment. And now we operate in 20 languages and nearly 70% of our revenue comes from outside the US. Without that opportunity made by global market and localization, Shutterstock would not be half of what it is today. So why does all this matter? What I've learned over the last 20 years of trying out ideas is that the ones that work best are the ones that take advantage of a new technical capability that changes what's possible. And as fellow technologists, you have a view into what's becoming possible for the very first time today. As fellow entrepreneurs, you have the opportunity to focus your efforts on the ideas that are most likely to disrupt the status quo because they take advantage of capabilities that are only now possible for the first time through this technology. I can't wait to see the many demos today and how they grow and evolve over time. And I hope that each of you who's looking, to, who's looking identifies your own moment of technological opportunity. And I look forward to the many rules that you and your creations will break for the very first time. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you, John. We're going to just have a brief conversation. Um, so I, I guess my, my first question is you talked about new technical capabilities um, and, and how Shutterstock has been able to take advantage of that. What are some of the new technical capabilities you see now to address some of the challenges that you see coming up in the next you know, five years and so? Um, well, we definitely all need access to internet. So broadband, uh, needs to be everywhere in the world, and broadband needs to be in every house uh, in the world, and every company needs super fast broadband. So increasing our capability as a, as, as a country and as, as the world needs is very important to us. Right. Um, as, as you pointed out, you now have over 500, um, 500 employees in, in New York, and yet you're a global company uh, in, as you said, 20 languages. Uh, why New York City, and how have you recruited sort of the right talent to help you build, build the company? Yeah, well, I, I grew up right around here, so and I never really wanted to live anywhere else. Um, <laughs> I've tried. I don't like anywhere else. Um, but the, the, <laughs> the cool thing is that when we did want to go international, we were, able, we were able to find people in New York that were um, bilingual, trilingual. Some even spoke four languages. So we were able to hire people that were able to answer the phone in four languages. And that greatly scaled our, our, our language translation, our internationalization from way early on so that we could be a truly global company today. The 70% revenue from outside the US, um, as I've done research, is highly unusual um, for companies even 10 years in because uh, it, it's, it's hard to build that scale. And, and if you can get it early on when you have that initial momentum, it's, it's pretty important. Right. Um, we, we have a, a range of, of different participants here today, some are entrepreneurs, some are media executives. Uh, what sort of advice would you give to, to those that are thinking about starting companies or leadership advice for those that are, are running companies? So, so the one thing is I didn't take any venture capital to begin with. I started with $10,000 
And uh, I was forced to make the product profitable from day one. And I think there are too few entrepreneurs that are doing that today. Uh, kind of the first thing an entrepreneur seems to do is uh, put together a PowerPoint presentation and then go look for funding. Um, I would instead go look for a technical co-founder, or if you could code yourself, try to throw a mock-up together. Try to get as far as you can without looking for cash, because it's, it actually takes a lot away from uh, the company uh, really quickly. You lose a bit of control, um, and, and you also get put into kind of this venture capital machine where you're bunched up with a whole bunch of other uh, companies in a risk portfolio and influenced in, in, in a way as, par as though you were part of that portfolio. If you're able to keep it as independent as possible for as long as possible, that I think is really important. Do you, do you think that that has become um, an important part of your culture? I mean, when you bootstrap a company, you're forced to be more innovative, you're creative, you look for different ways to do things. Is that yeah. part of the culture you're coming yeah, Even today, I still look for people that instead of, you know, they come up with an idea and instead of instantly asking for the budget for that idea, they try to find someone in the company to mock it up really quickly. and and do a proof of concept to see if it works. Um, and instead of putting together that long PowerPoint deck to pitch for, for cash inside the company, they're doing kind of similar things to what I did early on. Right. I look for that same cultural That's instinct. Right. Uh, well, John, you've done such an extraordinary job building your company, and thank you for being here today. Well, uh, do we have time for questions from the audience? And OK. Uh, sir, right there. We can hear you. I can repeat the question. So, uh, well, first of all, uh, my son in third grade is a Awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh, what a great company you have. Thank you. Um, but my, my question is, you mentioned that this was your 10th business. Now, so, that's, so that means, you know, one out of 10 or nine failures and then one, one huge success. But... Um, so people, like even in baseball, that's not considered a, a particularly good average. <laughs> um, a lot of us in this room would have, after the first, second, fifth, seventh attempt, would have said, you know something, we're just not cut out for this, I guess we'll just find a job. How did you have the perseverance or the, the, um, the self-confidence or whatever it took to keep on going until you got the one that really made it? Well, I, I had always read about entrepreneurs and studied entrepreneurs even when I was a kid. Um, whether it was reading about you know, Bill Gates or watching a movie on Silicon Valley, I, I would always kind of uh, I'd dig into kind of what made these, these people operate the way that, that they did. And it's, it's being comfortable with failing because no, no, no one gets their first try right. And a lot of people don't get their second, even their third or fourth or fifth. So, and even at Shutterstock, we have that same thing that goes on. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be okay with failing. And we run experiments constantly inside of all of our products. And you just have to, you just have to be comfortable with that and just know that the failure is actually something you're learning for the next product. I, I was, um, I, the way Shutterstock actually happened was I was marketing my other products with images and I couldn't find them. So I was trying to solve my own problem. If I never failed with those other companies, I never would have realized that this was a problem that businesses actually had today. Or back then. And, and even though he's one for 10, his one was a grand slam. So you know, he hits for the fences. Uh, do we have time for one, one more question? I didn't think it would be such a shy. In the back? Scream it out. It wasn't as much uh, a legal thing as, as much a cultural thing. Um, in a lot of places in the world, it was okay to steal stuff. Um, what happened uh, was iTunes kind of and Apple really set the, uh, that, that kind of uh, model going where if you can make something cheap enough and easy enough, people will, will pay for it. Um, so what we started to see was uh, a lot of the, the countries that we expected to see a lot of piracy from, we were actually seeing people start to buy from us. So that cultural shift has started to happen around a lot of the world, and, and we find that to be actually pretty pretty exciting. Yeah, John was telling me about some of the, the issues that they have in China and other countries. I mean, it really is a, a, you know, a global country. Um, I just also wanted to just acknowledge uh, Paul Horn and Orrin Herskovitz for all your help on, on the Media Lab. 
um, and, and uh, you know, um, all the other partners. And with that, uh, a big round of applause for John Oranger. So thank you. Thank you.